welcome everybody to week three of CSI 45. So um, we're going to continue our discussion of assembly today. And then uh, probably on Thursday we will probably start doing our first uh, computer architecture thing. And then next Tuesday we'll finally get around to giving out those Raspberry Pis because um, no, the quarantine kind of threw a wrench into things. So uh, we will be online through Thursday. Uh, my COVID test came back negative, so um, I'll be cleared to return to campus then. Okay, so one important thing uh, to mention is um, the early examples in ASM demos don't have the sort of proper boilerplate on them. Like if you look at uh, you know, example six, there's no push, there's no pop. Um, really the proper examples start um, once we're doing like function calls and things like that. Um, yeah, you, you really want to have these pushes and pops. And, um, um, you know, with every real function you have. Uh, including main. Main is, uh, if you're going to do any function calls, remember a function call is made using BL and a branch is used with B. And so probably the most common bug that I see in CSI 45 are students trying to do a function call, like if you're going to call a C function, like they'll screw up and use B to call the function instead of branch with link and vice versa. So branch with link modifies the link register and uh, automatically saves into the link register the return address so that you can come back from it. So if you do this, then the link register is still the same as the previous one and everything gets screwed up and vice versa. If you um, do a branch with link to do like a for loop or something, the return address is gonna be within the function itself and everything everything gets screwed up. So make sure you, do, you understand the difference between B and BL and um, um, understand that BLT is is B with a less than suffix, right? So that's that's a branch, not a branch of link. Um, there is BLLT is BL if less than. So. Uh, that's that's a really important thing to keep in mind. You guys will understand there is in B and BL and BLT. They can lay this back and lose You guys with me on this? That's that's probably the most common bug in this class. Uh, right up there with somebody like trying to multiply with a multiply R0, R05. can't do that. Right. That's probably the, the other most common bug. Okay. Um, B is, BL is a function call. Yeah. And B is for ifs and while loops and for loops and things like that. Yeah. So if you look at the loops example, um, BAL is B. That's branch always. So it's jumping so anytime you're you're jumping within the current function, um, that's B. You know, when you um, return from a function, you return using the link register, right? That's kind of what separates out a function from a you know non-function is that you're using the link register to go back to who called you. BLT. Mm. All right, so let's uh, talk about some uh, more with if statements. So if you wanted to uh, use and in assembly, there are the following <coughs> options. Uh, these are bitwise options, by the way. Um, for those of you that don't remember bitwise options, uh, bitwise is a um, tech incubator in downtown Fresno.
So when you do a bitwise and, what's happening is that it ands each pair of digits together in binary. Stream's not loading. I got 15 people watching right now. So you do a, when you do a bitwise and, um, if you and 101010 with 010101, then it ands each matching pair of, of bits. And so true ended with false is false, false ended with true is false, and so on and so forth. So did this, answered we one. We did, uh, uh, let's see here, that, the answer would be four. The rightmost digit is one, uh, let's see. Uh, the rightmost digit is, is one, then the next rightmost is the twos digit, then the fours digit, the eights digit, and so on and so forth. So only when both corresponding digits is one will an and give you a one as the output. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the main difference though between um, bitwise and and real life and is that, or, or regular and I should say, is that this is true, right? X is true, Y is true, but if you do a bitwise and between the two of them, then you get false, you get zero. Okay. So don't, don't confuse, don't confuse logical and and, and bitwise and. Okay. Um, bitwise or is, is actually fine. Bitwise or will pretty much always, yeah, will always give you the same answer as logical or. Um, but bitwise and is not equivalent to logical and. And the weird thing about or is that it is um, or or it's three letters because most assembly commands in ARM32 are three letters or okay. EOR is exclusive or and that's a bitwise uh, bitwise um, exclusive or operation. And move not is a bitwise not. It flips the bits. All trues become falses. All fa falses become true. Okay. If you want to do a logical and, you do something like this. So, um, so we compare our zero with zero. And then if it's not equal to zero, we put a one in there. We compare our one with zero and we add one to it. And then we see if we added two in there. So if, if both the first one and the second one were, if the first one and the second one are both not zero, then our two will have two in it. And we branch uh, either to Coolio or not Coolio. So, so basically both of these have to be um, non-zero to do a logical and. And um, C++ is something called short circuit evaluation, where if the first element is zero, then um, it just doesn't even do the second comparison. So uh, this is useful in a lot of situations, actually. Um, and C++ short circuit evaluation works like this. If pointer and pointer so in C++ you can write code like this if the pointer is not null and the pointer pointing to x or whatever equals 42 uh, the reason why this works, because this would this would this would seg fault, right? If if you have a pointer and it's null, if and you try dereferencing it, you get a you get a crash, right? Uh, this, however, will not ever crash because you're checking to see if it's null first. Uh, so if it is null, then it will short circuit. Okay. What that means is it will not 
even evaluate the second half of it. If the first clause here is false, it cannot be true that the whole thing is um, is true. And so C++ doesn't even bother checking the second term if the first term is false in an AND statement. And that allows you, that's actually a guarantee it's part of the language, it will not check the second one. It's not, it's not an optimization, it's actually part of the language. It will not check the second one if the first one is false. And so you can do, you can write code like that, where you do both your null pointer check and your dereference in the same line, like that. It's very common when working with pointers. Um, is EOR different equivalent to POW? Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, 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 no. This is not POW. This is, in C++, the caret symbol means exclusive or. So it goes through every pair of um, of um, bits and says, in this case, it would all be ones, right? Um, if either of them is true, but not both. So if we had like this here, the output would be this, right? I, one of them is true. One of them is true, one of them is true, but not both. Okay, so for the third one, they're both true, so the exclusive or gives you a zero there. Okay. This is all stuff we cover in like 40 and 41. Um, yeah, caret is not, um, is not pal. No. Yeah, good question. Okay. Um, so if you want to do short circuit evaluation, you first compare the first one. And if it's false, then we jump down to the not Coolio branch immediately. We don't even do the second comparison. And then we do the second comparison, and then if that one's also zero, we jump down to not Coolio, and um, and then we jump to Coolio if it's good. But here I commented it out because it'll fall through, right? It'll just it, in, in assembly you just keep going. Okay. There's no there's no curly braces. There's no flow control. It just runs down the line. Okay. Um, move one at R zero, move, okay. So this is a way of exiting a program, by the way. So this is putting an error code of one into R zero, and then this is doing a system call to exit. This is putting zero into the return value, and then doing the same system call to exit. All right. Um, So that's, that's how you can do, uh, and you can just use the, the bitwise or for or. The reason for that is because if you have um, either, if, if either of them is true, the output of the logical and bitwise or will both be true. It'll be non-zero. So, um, or is actually um, reasonable. You don't have to do anything special for that. Um, there is short circuit evaluation with or as well. Um, So um, if Bob returns true, it will not even call Sydney. Okay, because if you have an OR statement, if the first uh, element of it is true, the whole thing's true, and so it won't even call the second one. So even even if you have like a function call, it won't call the second one, and and this will deeply baffle and miss mystify you if you do not know about short circuit evaluation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, or is 
basically no different than logical or the. All right, uh, any questions about that? If you want to combine more complicated if statements together. I take your silence on chat channel to mean you understand everything. So let's move on. How about nested if statements? Uh, same, same basic idea is that you will, uh, you know, you evaluate one and then you jump to a block and then you can evaluate another one and then jump to a block. And you just have, just be careful with your jumps, like your branch statements, you know, you do one and then, you know, you go to another, you can do something like this where you can count how many, how many true clauses you have. You know, if you're doing like an if inside of an if, then if both of them are true, then you do the inner block. Otherwise you don't. So. Is repeat with different registers. Yeah. Yeah, you can do multiple comparisons. Like if it's just a straight up if X inside of that, if Y inside of that, if Z, that's the equivalent to if X and Y and Z, right? So um, parallel, parallel if statements are like, or nested if statements are like, and. Think about it, like, uh, Right, like that is the same thing as if x and y. Right. Same thing. Whereas um, if x, if y is the same thing as if Same thing. Uh, except it, it could it could feasibly call foo twice, right? Like in this one. So you have to be careful not to call it twice. All right. Um, yeah, you, you basically coded the same way. Uh, program to be powers of two. Right, so, um, uh, isn't this what we did for loops? I think so. So rather than, um, rather than doing a multiply, and this is actually one of the ways you could save strokes in your ASM first program, uh, SWI is for system calls. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so rather than you using a multiply by two, you can do a left shift, okay? So in C++, there is the left shift operator and the right shift operator, which uh, was chosen by uh, Bjarni back in the late 70s to represent outputting and inputting from a stream, um, a decision that the C people uh, highly did not like because this is actually the left shift operator and the right shift operator. Like this would take all the bits in a variable and move them one to the left. This take all the bits in the variable and moves them one to the right. Okay. Now, um, if you have a signed integer and an unsigned integer, you have to choose um, whether you're doing an arithmetic shift right or a logical shift right. Arithmetic shift right is used for signed integers. Logical shift right is used for unsigned integers. But uh, essentially they do the same thing. Every time you shift the bits right once, it divides by two. Every time you shift the left, the bits left one, it multiply by, it multiplies by two. And that's because the value of each bit is twice the one, you know, every time you go left, right? It goes the one's bit, the two's bit, the four's bit, the eight's bit. So if you take all the bits and shift them left, then you get, um, multiply by two. All right. So, um, equals five. 1010 equals 10. So a left shift by one bit 
is the same as a multiply by two. So you might be able to see how some people were able to save, um, save strokes. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can you can basically do it either directly with just a move, which is just a straight. You get left shifted or right shifted or whatever, or you can combine it with an add or a multiply or whatever you know. And uh, actually, I don't know if multiply because multiply is weird. But what this will do is it'll add R four to itself, but left shifted once, and that gives you multiply by three. Okay, so. Normally we use shifts to do uh, multiplies and divides by powers of two, but if you're clever about it, you can go up and uh, down one as well. So you do a multiply by five, uh, multiply by nine, that kind of stuff, just using an add with a left shift on it. So for example, if I were to do this, um, times two, times four times eight, this would be that. So if you want to do a multiply by nine, in one cycle instead of four, you do this. You take the bits, left shift it three times, that's times two, times four, times eight. Then you add it to the original value, ten, times nine. Okay. Kind of cool. Fizzbuzz does not require modulus. I'll say that again. Yeah, Fizzbuzz does not require modulus. It doesn't. You just uh, just do your thing. All right. Um, yeah, shifts, useful stuff. Um, if you don't remember these from uh, C or C++, you can always go back and review them. Um, so before we get into arrays, let's talk about system calls because you guys have been asking about that. So uh, I don't think this link works anymore, unfortunately. Let's, let's see if it does. Yeah, yeah, okay, it does. All right. So uh, complete list of system calls. So if you've ever wondered, like, How things actually take place, like how things actually happen. Like how do you actually print a character to the screen? Um, all of that eventually goes through the operating system. Okay. So the operating system, and all of you will take an operating systems class, which is um, a very useful class, uh, honestly. Because um, it kind of explains a lot. Um, I had a really good instructor for operating systems, and then um, after I took operating systems, I had um, one of my favorite programming classes ever, which was basically a systems calls class. It was uh, going through all of the system calls in Linux and learning what each of them do and how to use them and why you use them and things like that. And the reason for that is because what the operating system provides to you with system calls is ultimately the list of everything you can do in programming. <laughs> okay? Because the operating system sits between your program and the hardware. Okay? You cannot directly access the CPU. What happens is, uh, yeah, sure, the basic stuff like adding and subtracting and stuff like that you can do, but anytime you really want to get something done, like open a file, uh, connect to a network socket, anything like beyond, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide. If you want to print things to the screen, if you want to delete a file, if you want to duplicate a file, if you want to duplicate a process, all of that goes through the operating system. Do you guys know what a process is? Out of curiosity. Product, do you know what a, a process is? Trust the process. Do you know? You do not. So if you type PS, 
that will show you the list of processes you have open right now. So, um, PS AUX will show you all of the processes running on the server right now. So you can see that Aaron's logged in, you can see that Vargas is logged in, Pat is logged in, Vienna's logged in, even though he's not in class. Seriously, Vienna, you, you can be on the server, but you're not in, not in voice chat. Vienna's logged in several times. Okay. So a process is, um, well, have you ever run task manager product? It will trust the process. Task manager, yeah, it's background processes. Hmm? Hmm. It's all the programs you have open. Okay. I don't like how they call these apps, but you know, these are all processes. Okay, and uh, right process ID, right? So these are all the different processes you have on on the system. It's basically the programs you got running. Okay. Uh, calls out, calling out people. <laughs> who's logged in right now? Okay, and not just who's logged in, but like what programs are running on the on the whole system, right? And there's quite a few that's running at once. And uh, you can type PS just by itself to see what programs you're running. Right now I'm running TCSH, which is my shell, because I'm um, an idiot and don't use Bash. Well, I sometimes use Bash, but I mostly use TC shell, because Windows 10 ma Task Manager, you don't like it, night? Yeah, it's, it's fair. But um, uh, if you want to see the top processes running on the... Uh, Raspberry Pi, you can type top. I like htop, it's a better version of top. Tops, uh, yeah, I think I have an alias. Um, it'll show you, it's like Task Manager, basically, it shows you. Uh, now people are running htop, so. Uh, Prado's running it, Crente's running it, Aaron ran it, Chapman's running it, Vargas is running it. No, oh, Vargas is running a game. Gaming on company time, my man. All right. Um, and so it'll show you, I got four cores on the system. It'll show you how busy each core is, how much memory is being used, swap space. And yeah, it's, and then if you want to actually kill things, if I want to kill Aaron's process, I can F9 and send a signal term to it. It won't work because I'm, I'm not running this as root. Uh, if I ran this as root, now I can pick off people's processes. Yeah, so here's Aaron's thing, and then I can nuke it. All right, and I can sort by user. And we could like nuke his SSH process. And then that'll boot him off the server. So, <laughs> yes. Okay, where was I going with that? Okay, so system calls. So like if you wanted to find out the list of systems, uh, of uh, processes running on the system, that goes through a system call. If you want to get information about a file, um, I don't have it, main.cc, uh, ls-l led.c. Uh, this is, you know, goes through a system call. Like basically anything like useful you want to do beyond, you know, the basic ARM32 stuff of add, subtract, multiply, to, you know, no, no divide, no mod, uh, branch, um, and or XOR, um, your sorry, your goes through system calls. Okay. And so, like I said, one of the absolute favorite classes I ever took is with a guy named Bennett Yee, who, uh, um, just a fantastic, brilliant dude. Uh, 
Let's see what he's up to these days. BSY. Yeah, I actually, I actually heard about him before, like when I was like in high school, because um, I bought a, uh, I bought a book, um, um, that basically had all the most interesting web pages on the internet on it. That's how small the internet was back when I was in high school, and um, he wrote a uh, web-enabled uh, vending machine. So you could log in to the vending machine, it would tell you there's seven cans of Coke remaining, two cans of Sprite, that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. You know, in the future, like, we'll be able to, like, log into our local vending machines. And, you know, that still doesn't happen today. But, but he had one. And so, like, when I took him for, for his class, I'm like, hey, are you that guy that I read about in the book? He's like, yeah, I am. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. And uh, he... Uh, um, he's a really cool dude and um, works for Google now as far as I know um, did a little thing called Chrome OS so um, so his class I took several classes with him um, you now they have a big window so you can see the soda yeah but you have to like walk in front of it you know back in back in the day it was like more sci-fi than today you could actually log into the the Coke machine you know Okay, so uh, now it's called like Internet of Things, right? Um, still hasn't taken off, you know. Looking around here, I'm like, I don't have an internet-enabled toaster, or fridge, or anything like that because I don't trust it. Um, yeah, so basically, in his class, we went through all the system calls, right? So system call one is exit, so that quits a program. And that's why you see in here, see in here, <laughs> see in here. Uh, what was the last one we did? Uh, pointers. Shifty. It was logic. Yeah. So here you can see that it is doing software interrupt zero. So if software interrupt zero, and it's always software interrupt zero, um, says call the operating system, invoke the operating system, let the operating system take over. Okay. Uh, IoT is the devil to security professionals. Yeah, that's why I don't have any IoT devices in my house. Um, I, I have zero trust. The whole industry was built from the ground up on a um, framework that placed no emphasis on security. Uh, it was all about ease of use, not security, and so I don't, I don't buy it, and a lot of people don't because of that reason. So, um, yeah. So SWI zero means um, let uh, give control to the operating system. Okay. So whenever you do SWI zero, the operating system takes over, and the operating system checks register seven. And parameters are passed to syscalls using, um, sorry, register zero through three as normal. Okay. So you actually put your parameters into R zero through R three, and then you choose your uh, system call with register seven, and then you SWI zero, and it takes over. And so uh, register seven with a one is exit, so it quits. If you put a two into register seven, it will do a fork. So fork will duplicate your current process where you had one hello world running. Now you got two at the exact same point. It actually duplicates your current process. A read will read from a file descriptor. Okay. That is how CN works or F streams work. At the bottom of the call chain, it's going to be doing a call to syscall read. Okay. There is no such thing as CN or C out or 
printf or scanf when you get down to it. All of them are just nice, pretty little wrappers sitting on top of calls to syscall read and number four, syscall write. When you open a file for reading and writing, that is syscall open. So you open a file with syscall open, you read from a file with syscall read, you write to a file with syscall write, and you also read and write to the keyboard the same way because the keyboard and the screen are also file descriptors. So in Linux, there's this notion of a file descriptor. Every process starts with three, standard in, standard out, and standard error. Okay, standard in is zero, standard out is one, standard error is two. So a file descriptor is just an unsigned integer. Okay, so if you pass in read from zero, it's gonna read from the keyboard. And you pass it a pointer to a chunk of memory and it will read, if you put in a 10 here, it will read 10 bytes from the keyboard and put it into that chunk of memory. It's not the easiest thing to use. It doesn't convert from a string to an integer for you or into a floating point number. That's why we have scanf. That's why we have cn to do the type conversions and things like that and to make it look all pretty. That's why I write, wrote my read lib and it's called read for a reason. It is an even nicer layer sitting on top of the syscall read function. Okay. It actually sits on top of CN. So, but uh, fixes the fixes the problems with, with CN, with IO streams. Okay, do you guys understand what I'm getting at here? System calls are ultimately what you can do on a system. If there's not a system call for it, um, you don't have any access to the hardware. The operating system mediates all connections between the hardware and software. Okay. So you can't read from the keyboard unless the operating system gives you permission. If they don't give you permission, you can't read from the keyboard. Um, that's what keeps you from being able to read from files that other people have. If you try opening a file, you just pass in a file name. Right? If I tried opening, um, let's do stat um, Aaron's uh, main.cc, permission denied, right? I passed it a file name that's, a, that's inside of Aaron's directory, and it's like, nope, you don't have permission to do it. Okay, actually, I don't know if that file exists. Let's become him for a second. It didn't exist anyway. Okay. Um, okay. All right, there we go. So here's all the information about a file. There's actually a system call called stat, by the way. So here's the system call. System call is called stat. You pass in a path name, and then it writes the information into a struct. And the struct um, looks like this. It tells you uh, the file type, the user ID of the owner, group ID of the owner, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what this is printing out here when you run the Unix stat command. It gives you all the information on a file. And that is from system stat. It looks like there's an old stat and a new stat. Yeah. Yeah. Not have all of them in here. If you want to change permissions, if you want to change who owns a file, all these things, uh, if you want to get the current time, if you want to change what directory you're in, you want to run a new program, if you want to um, link a file, unlink a file, create a file, wait for another process to finish, close a file, open a file, all these things, these are the fundamental tools you have to program with. Everything you do with all this, like all the library stuff, all the standard library stuff, all of that sits on top of 
this. So, yeah, so if I tried, uh, let's do this, PWD. So if I try statting um, Aaron's main.cc, permission denied. Now if I do this with root access, I can do it. You guys see the difference there? So sudo gives you root access, okay? And so by running sudo, I was able to overwrite the, uh, the, the, when I did it first, the operating system said, nope, permission denied. You do not, you have no power here, Gandalf, right? And then I'm like, nope, sudo, give me root access, uh, super user access. And uh, there's also do as, right? Uh, so I'm saying run as root uh, this program and then it gives me all the information I want and if in fact I wanted I could come up here and just delete his I could delete his main.cc just like that from my directory by running it as root should I hit return okay. <laughs> do it do it now okay. you have no power yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's too funny. <laughs> Jeez, my lord, dude. All right. Um, uh, he posted a GIF of what I thought I thought was going to be. You have no power here, but it's actually Gandalf taking off his robes. Uh, that's too funny. All right. So, do you guys understand about system calls? Like I said, th this is something that. You know, you can you can spend a whole class on um, just going through all the different all the different things, and, and maybe we'll maybe we'll do a full lecture on that at some point. But um, um, but that's kind of how you do it, right? So if you want to um, do system calls, you do SWI zero. So that's system call four, and we're passing in one, which is standard out, a string of length 29, and uh, we haven't learned this yet. No. We're, we're putting the memory address of a string into register two. Yeah. Uh, no, that's, yeah, that's the length of it. All right. That's the string. The string goes into register one. The length goes into register two. And then we invoke uh, write, write a system call four. And then this will print a string to the screen. So for those of you that were asking, why are we not doing C out in assembly? Uh, that's because this is the, uh, the rigmarole you have to go through to, to print something. It's a lot easier to just do it in C or C++. But this is, um, this is how you actually do it. So there is something called the data segment in assembly. So your code is normally in the um, the text segment, the code segment. It defaults to the text segment, so you don't need to specify it. But you can do text like that, and then that says we're in the code segment. Uh, the data segment um, the data segment um, holds data. This is in a code. All right. It's a bunch of labels. And then, um, and then we got variables. So we haven't talked about arrays yet, but I guess I'll explain it right now. Why not? Um, LDR, we have, we, I haven't explained LDR story yet. So maybe, maybe let's, let's j jump into that before we uh, confuse you. So let's get into arrays. Okay. So let's say you wanted to make an array of 100 integers. How many bytes is this? How many bytes long is an array of 100 integers? Anyone know? Four hundred. Very good, Mr. Vargas. So, um, so what we're going to do is fill this array with uh, 
two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate, right? So it's gonna, array element zero is gonna be equal to zero, array element one is gonna be equal to two, then four, then six, then eight. And then we're gonna print out array element 10. All right, so here's how that works. Here is a new command, LDR, okay? So LDR loads, it is the load command, okay? And the equal sign here means get the address of R. R is a label. Down here in the data segment, you can see that we have a label called R. Okay. And R is 400 bytes long. So you see how I have dot space. Dot space just means allocate 400 bytes. So I'm allocating statically, static allocation this is in the um, the data segment. Um, it's just R is going to always be pointing, it's like a pointer basically, to the beginning of a chunk of 400 bytes of memory. So this is exactly the same thing as a static array in, in C, although um, if you did something like this, um, this would be stack allocated, right? <clears throat> And we're doing static allocation instead. Uh, hello world. Uh, yeah, that should do it, I think. 5, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, so does that print uh, hello world night? Yeah, very cool. All right, so well then, Mr. Knight. Uh, you guys see that on chat? I'll put it up on the stream for those of you that are logged in on the server and not watching the stream <laughs> Vienna. Um, this is Hello World in Assembly, right? So it's choosing the system call for write. It is putting one into R0, which is standard out. It is putting the address of hello into R1. And this is an ASCII string. Um, yeah, you can do it that way, I guess. Usually I use ASCII Z, a, a null terminated, but uh, that's fine too. Because uh, you have the size here. Uh, it's going to print out 13 bytes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Did I do that right? 5, 10, 12, 13. Yeah. Um, and then it calls the operating system. The operating system will then print 13 bytes from this memory address. It prints the world to the screen. And then it does the system called the exit. That is hello world. Very good. Very good. Okay. Everyone give uh, Mr. Knight a clap emoji for doing that. Alright. So, um, here's two new, two new commands we got load, we got store. So, load loads an address and store um, it, basically this is how you read and write to RAM okay this is these are the last two uh, really assembly commands that um, that you're gonna learn uh, after that we're done with arm 32 <laughs> wait it's week three we're already done yeah um, we're gonna be getting into VFP and float at some point probably later in the semester I'm not gonna worry about it for now this is actually not part of ARM32. It's part of an extension to it uh, called Neon and VFP. Um, yeah, so with uh, with this lecture today, you're you're basically done learning ARM32. Yeah, that's it. Then you get a lot of have you get a, you get to have a lot of practice writing our ARM32 programs to get good at it. Okay, so. Um, there is load and store. And by default, these things load and store 32 bits. Okay? So if you uh, were to pass it, if you do something like this, um, store. Okay. So okay. well, to do this, we need a load, but that's fine. Okay, so this is putting 65 into R7. And then it's going to star. It's it's going to store star. It's going to store uh, sixty five at this memory address here. Okay. 
And so store is the only command in um, store is the only command in ARM32 where the source register is the first one. Okay. So this is the only one where the data goes this way. And all other commands in ARM32, it, you know, add R0, R0, R1, you're writing into the R0. Store is the only one where it goes the other way. And the reason why it does that is, is because uh, it has to. <laughs> the, way that, the way that ARM commands are set up with um, the weird flexible second parameter, um, the, the, the source, the, the source the, where the data is coming from has to be in the first parameter because you can't do this backwards. It, it doesn't work with the ARM32 uh, format. Uh, of how they have these uh, flexible parameters set up. Same reason why there's reverse subtract, right? Because only the last parameter is flexible. Short class, good game, easy. Yeah. Well. Okay, so let's go through this. Um, okay, there's both store and there's store byte. Okay. So load and store do 32 bits. They load one register essentially. And, and it's actually, yeah, it, you just load 32 bits from RAM or you write 32 bits to RAM and you have a pointer and a pointer is a memory address. So you just say, add this memory address, load from RAM, add this memory address, write to RAM. That's basically all it boils down to. Um, you can also get a pointer this way. So load is also used for getting pointers to things. So down here at the bottom, in the data segment, we're loading the address of R. So, um, so this is like saying um, int pointer pointer so R. So if you have a data segment, you can define arrays down there and strings and things like that. And you can just define constants as well. So this is defining a constant called multiplier, setting it equal to two. Uh, we're making a constant um, called bits per integer, which is four. We're making an array of size 400 using dot space and there's some other Alternatives to this as well, but dot space works for me. It just says allocate 400 bytes. And so every time the program runs, there's going to be a chunk of 400 bytes. And R is a pointer to the top of it, to the beginning of it. Okay. And then we have here a string, which is an ASCII with a, a null terminator at the end of it. That's the difference between what Mr. Knight had. He had ASCII, uh, ASCII. -I. This is ASCII Z. The zero means um, it has a null character at the end. So there's actually a secret character at the end of the string that is the null character. And in C, all strings have a null character at the end of them to indicate the end of string. That's what I was saying, like when he did hello world, it would work fine uh, because he was giving an exact byte count as to how many bytes to write to the screen. So it was fine. But uh, if you ever use any of the string library functions like stir cat to concatenate strings together, uh, they, have, they, they all require null terminated strings. And so in general, unless that extra byte is gonna cause you to run out of RAM, um, in general, it's safer to use ASCII Zs. So that uh, <coughs> if you do any of these string functions, like stir comp, which takes a pointer to one string and a pointer to another string, C strings. We're in C world right now. Uh, you take a pointer to one string and a pointer to another string, it goes through them and tells you if they're the same, if one's greater, if one's less than. And if you don't give it a null uh, terminated string, it'll run forever, <laughs> right? Or until it hits a zero. So it's really important to use ASCII Z as much as possible. Although in, in his case, it was arguably better because it 
doesn't waste that extra byte of RAM. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? What are we doing here in the data segment? Permanently blocking off 400 bytes of memory, calling it R, so we can use it as an array. We're not using new. We're not using delete. These are just statically allocated. It's every time you run the program, there's 400 bytes named R. Okay. Okay. So um, this is how you load a pointer. Okay. So we're we're calling R1 a pointer, um, and we're we're putting into it the address of R. The pointer is just a memory address. It's just an int, really. Uh, we set i equal to 0, we set r3 equal to 2, we set r4 equal to 4. Um, notice this. This is not... <laughs> up until now, every time we did a hashtag, right, it's with a, a numeric literal, right? 65, right? 0, right? If you use this command down here, eq, that's how you can make consts, constant integers. Kind of cool. You guys see that? So if you want to make a constant integer, you can use dot eq equivalent to, all right, or equals or something. I don't know. And now I can say hashtag multiplier, hashtag bits per integer, all right. So I can actually have uh, no magic numbers, right? It, it, there's no difference if I I, I could have just typed two here. I could I could have done this, right? But more readable, it's more human readable. You guys like that? Okay. Um, all right, so we are going to compare R2 with 100, so we're gonna be counting up this time instead of counting down like we did last time. Usually in, in assembly you count upwards, but whatever, or count, count downwards, but I'm just duplicating the C code now. So we're going to count from zero up. If we ever hit 100, then we jump to the bottom of the loop. Multiply R5, R2, and R3. So we're doing our multiplication here. Remember, we're setting each element in the array to be um, a multiple of two, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, as we go through. Okay. And then uh, we figure out the byte offset. So if we're 10 integers in, we're 40 bytes to the right. Remember, every integer is four bytes. So if we're at square bracket 10, we are 40 bytes to the right of the pointer. And so what we have here is the loop counter, and we have here in our four, the bytes per integer, which is four. So if we're at, uh, if we're at address 10, we multiply 10 times four, you get 40 bytes. So R6 is the offset. R6 is how far to the right of the pointer we are. And this is actually technically wrong. This is uh, that. Because um, in C++, it does the multiplication by four for you, right? You just put, you pass in square bracket 10, and it knows that you are an array of integers, so it multiplies 10 times the size of an integer for you, okay? Um, yeah, that's why you need to know the type in C++. If you had a character array and you did square bracket 10, it would be 10 bytes to the right. If you had a short array, it'd be 20 bytes to the right. If you had an n array, it's 40 bytes to the right. If you had a long, long array, it's 80 bytes to the right, each with an index of 10. Okay. Assembly, we don't have any types, right? So you have to do it yourself. So you have to know the size of, you have to know the size of an integer, four. So uh, we multiply the uh, i, how far we are into the array, times 4. That's our offset, how far to the right of the pointer we are. R1 is the pointer, right? So R1 is the start of the array. And this is the syntax, OK? So you see I have square brackets here. So it's kind of like square brackets in C++, kind of, sort of. Uh, so this is this is the base pointer. This is the um, array. That's the offset. And so what that's saying is take the base plus the offset and write to that memory address the value in R5. 
So as, as we go through, we're going to write the first time through the loop, R5 is going to be 0. Second time through the loop, R5 is going to be 2. Third time through the loop, it's going to be 4. And so it's going to write 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 as we go through the loop. 2, the base stays the same every time. R1 never changes anywhere within this code. But uh, R2 changes each time, right? We add 1 to R2 every time, R2D2. And um, as we add 1 to R2, the value we're going to write in goes up by 2 every time. And the address we're going to write to goes up by 4 every time. And so we run through memory, writing each multiple of 2 into the array until we've done 100 of them. Then we jump to the bottom. And uh, then we're now going to print array 10. Right? The original code was here. So we, we just did the for loop. We wrote into RAM using our pointers. And now we're going to print the element 10. So we put 10 into the off of the uh, i, i is equal to 10. Uh, we multiply by 4. R4 still has bytes per integer. And then we call the print string function. So the print string function uh, takes, um, what does it take? Where is it? Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, oh, no, 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 sorry. It's not a function. This is actually a string. So we're loading, we're loading the string into register zero. We're um, putting in um, the uh, integer we're going to print into register one. And you see how we're doing a load here. So this is loading from RAM. What we did before was storing into RAM. So you load from RAM with LDR and you write to RAM using STR. Okay. And I'm going to give you guys some lab time to, to mess with this. Um, LDR loads from RAM and it takes either a pointer. There's there's a couple different ways you can do this. If you just did a pointer by itself, it'll load the integer at the first element of R, right? So if you just did it like this, it would load R square bracket zero. But if you want to have an offset, then and you want to load from R square bracket ten, this is how you do it. So you pass in R one the pointer, and you pass in forty for R six. It's 10, 10 integers to the right. And so that'll load the integer there. Load from RAM, the number goes into R1. We then call the printf function. The printf function reads the format string as its first parameter. It reads whatever was in RAM there as the second parameter, and it will print array square bracket 10 equals um, 20. And that's that. So for your lab time today, I would like for you to um, I would like for you to do something very similar to this. Um, let's see. Let's copy this. And remember you've got you've got all this sample source code, so you don't need me to leave it up on the screen, right? It's all in your ASM demos directory. Then lab time. We'll do an integer array, I guess. Um, And we'll do it of size 1,000. And the first 500. Um, Make it simple for you. Okay. Then print the whole thing. Mm, it is gonna it's gonna spam you too much. Let's, let's make it small. So.
You guys understand? Make an array of size 20. How many bytes is that, everyone? How many bytes is an array of size 20 integers? Eighty, good. So start with the uh, example for arrays. Modify to seek uh, suit your needs. Uh, so you're going to start off by zero filling it. Uh, not a array of size, a thousand of size twenty. And you can probably combine these together so you don't waste the effort. But basically, the uh, the second half of the array should all be zeros. The first half of the array should be uh, the value and the index will be the same. So your array is going to hold 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then all zeros for the back half. And then you're going to print all of these to the screen. And after you do that, um, screenshot and post on Discord. And do you guys want anything more complicated than that? Or is that, do you think that's good for today? Okay. And then you can peace out. Okay. Easy. So uh, you can use the print int function. Um, Wherever that is, you just make one, I guess. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, actually, let's say do it in C. So you're gonna have your your heart, the main of your program is gonna be an assembly. You're gonna be calling a print hit function in C. Okay. And uh, yeah, so you so use printf. Okay. So it's good to get it's it, like, like I said, it's good to get experience with printf and scanf, simply because that format string way of doing things is very popular in computer science. It crops up in a lot of weird places. So. If you've been using uh, C out until now, use printf. Okay, would be a good experience for you. Yep. So once you guys once you guys get the code done, you can you can leave. Okay. So get her done. All right. That's it for today. Thanks, guys. Welcome to Sea World. I know. There, I'll I'll, I'll post this on Discord. Have fun in lab time. I'll be watching. Uh, I'll be watching the channel if you have any questions.